So welcome to AI4. Uh, this is uh, a, a good partner of ours. Hope you've enjoyed your time at the conference. Uh, my name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of Project Voice. We're a company that uh, combines content and community to accelerate adoption of conversational AI. That's text, voice, chat, and everything. And in addition to that, in our annual conference we do in April, which AI4 is a partner on, um, I also am a general partner of Project Voice Capital Partners in which we identify and invest in early stage, top tier, conversational AI founders and companies. So pleased to have a great panel of folks here. I'm gonna let them each introduce themselves and we're gonna talk about using AI to uh, retain customers. So Charleston, if you wanna go first. Thank you, Brad, really appreciate it. Um, I'm Charles Malcolmus, I'm from Capital One. Uh, I cover architecture for customer servicing, broad machine learning data, customer resiliency at one of our largest businesses in Capital One. I've been there for about five years. Um, I've done a lot in our conversational AI space as well as led a bunch of our machine learning teams. So AI4 has been great for me. Um, yesterday had a little bit of time to cover kind of developing an AI first strategy at one of the talks. And uh, personally, I want to find out where Brad got these sneakers afterwards because they're the coolest ones I've ever seen. <laughs> Over to you, Ahmed. Hi, my name is Ahmed Reza. I am an AI geek turned entrepreneur and suddenly find myself in the spotlight quite literally. Uh, I'm the founder of Yobi. Uh, we build synthetic agents, so we build AI for communications. Wanted to imagine what communications would look like in the future for our businesses. And that's what we're doing. We'll do a little show and tell during this maybe. Hi, I'm Vivek Goel. Uh, I lead the AI automation and integration practice at Foot Locker, which is where I bet you bought the, your sneakers on. <laughs> right? Or better, next sneaker should be from there, <laughs> if not this one. Uh, so, so I have been a part of Foot Locker for about a couple of years, building out this uh, new capability uh, with a focus on uh, retail and has been in the AI automation ML space for past 10 plus years uh, in across financial services, business processes, healthcare, and now retail. Perfect, yeah, appreciate it, gentlemen. And yeah, thanks for making my shoes the focal point of this <laughs> panel for some reason. So um, look, the, the point of this panel in this session um, is for y'all to go away with having one take away from each of these three gentlemen on how they're either looking to implement AI to retain customers or better yet, how they're already using it. I think that's one of the great things about this, this AI movement that we're all in, this new era, that uh, there's a real hunger for use cases and a real intolerance for um, pontification on the subject. People want stuff that's real. So Charleston, I'm gonna start with you and go through the panel uh, again and uh, really take, take your time to unpack this for us. What is, some, what is the main thing that Capital One is doing with AI right now to retain customers? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's an obviously very tough question because Capital One's really big. And um, I think we're very excited uh, about all the opportunities in AI. And we've certainly been practitioners for a while now. Um, you know, I think we have some pretty awesome commercials out there uh, with some people talking about some of the, you know, fraud models that we have in place that do things like second looks and make sure that you're actually getting charged the right amount uh, when you go out to eat and you're not really paying attention to the bill, which that happens to me often. So I appreciate uh, our ability to like catch those things. Um, Capital One is definitely always kind of like pushed in the forefront a little bit with uh, its technology, you know, first bank into the cloud, um, all in on, you know, machine learning and open source. I think um, from a customer retent, what? Saying have your mic up a little higher. Oh, is it not loud enough? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe it's because I'm turning my head. Yeah. So I, I think from a customer retention standpoint, uh, you know, we, we factor in a lot of our investments on where we're gonna create the most leverage for our customers. That's always where we're working backwards from is how we're best gonna set our customers up for success. And um, really looking at where the value is for them, you know, whether that's fraud related, protecting, you know, protecting their money, protecting their experiences, um, or it's how they're being serviced. 
So there's a, there's a number of different areas where certainly we're very excited to continue to explore and invest, um, ensuring to your point that we're still actually getting, getting the right returns for our customers. You know, we're not just um, doing things purely for an entertainment value. Well, before we let you off the hook, so one of the cool things about Capital One was, and one of the main trends that we keep an eye on with on the fun side of things is that companies um, that experimented with voice AI in the Alexa era were are much better positioned for success in the ChatGPT era. And Capital One was definitely one of those companies that worked with Amazon and Google a little bit, Amazon more so, on trying to extend themselves out to the customer through that ecosystem. Um, what was the fruits of that tree, you know, in your mind? Was that something that you had your eyes on with where you sit within the organization? Is that something that's talked about internally? What can you share? Sure, and I, I actually used to lead a number of teams in our conversational AI space. Uh, it's something that Capital One invested in very early, um, and it's an area where we're definitely very excited about, certainly in this new era of LLMs and uh, ChatGPT. Uh, we're absolutely you know, exploring what are the right ways to leverage it in the future, um, but certainly we're doing it with our customers in mind and you know, the, the risk tolerances that we need to be sensitive to. So uh, I, I think Capital One will have you know, some really interesting experiences in store in the future. And I, I agree with you. I think the, the lessons we've learned and the journey that we've been on now for a number of years have definitely proved to be very formative to how we approach solving our customer experiences. <clears throat> Thank you. Excellent. Ahmed, so tell us about Yobi. Um, you're you're the startup on the on the bunch here. Tell us all about the company and everything that y'all do. All right. So last year, a, a little before last year, our biggest problem was not creeping people out, because you know we talked to our customers and they were like, Ahmed, we love you. You know, make us lots of money, but just don't say AI too much. We think of Terminator. And then ChatGPT comes out and everybody's like, we want some AI. I was like, we got tons of it. Right, so Yobi stands for Yobi Byte. It's short for Yobi Byte, two to the power 80. How many geeks in here get that? <laughs> yes, that sucks. That's why Lisa Bankston renamed it to Yobi. A lot cuter. Uh, so what Yobi does is unifies all of your communications, brings it all in one place. So you give us your communications, you give us your Salesforce data, your, like as much data as you can feed the brain in the cloud, which is what we were building. Uh, we believe that that will allow you to do things in your business at scales and that hasn't been possible before. And uh, the reason I know this is because my previous startup, I built something using AI that did marketing for dentists. And it seems really weird why right? an AI guy would do that. But my friend who was a dentist uh, was spending a lot of money on his marketing and I wanted to prove to him that he was a horrible person for spending money with Yellow Pages. If anybody is here from the Yellow Pages, I'm sorry. Uh, so we tracked his calls, we transcribed it. He was a dentist, and we figured out that after spending about $10,000 over three months, he only got 56 phone calls, 10% conversion rate. And you could tell pretty accurately that that was not a good cost per acquisition. And his AdWords was, were doing better. And that actually, that what started out as kind of a joke, ended up becoming my first company. And it started making millions in revenues, like we bootstrapped it. It just organically grew. And I couldn't believe it because, you know, the problem with engineers is we want problems worthy of our brains, right? So I just didn't want to accept that this thing was making millions of dollars and all it was doing was just figuring out customer acquisition cost, right? Until I go, wait, these customer things are important. All right. So sold that company in 2018, did pretty well, became uh, an investor, uh, like, in private equity, started learning a lot more about business and realizing that customer service, sales, these things really, like that's, that, that's what matters for a business is your top line revenue, your cogs, right? Your margins, like so much of your business is about how you make money. And we knew that if we could improve uh, each dentist that we were working with, like on average was making an extra $400,000 a year just with this little application of AI. So if we could now take all of your communications and take your CRM data 
we could probably optimize your ads for you on the fly, like at machine speed, not at human speed. So we started doing this, uh, uh, also transformers were a thing, you know, there's a paper by attention is all you need, right? So if you're an AI guy, 2019 was a pretty exciting time to be an AI guy. Like there wasn't hype, but you know, instead of crypto, I did AI. No offense to crypto guys. Um, so then our biggest challenge was getting, like would people buy it? We put it up on the App Store, we made it super easy. You can get Yobi anywhere. You can download it on your Mac, iPhone, Android. Uh, and again, dead simple, I have it like right here. And it helps you scale. So rather than just talk a lot more about it, I'm gonna do like a little bit of show and tell. If you could take out your phone and send me a message, you'll talk to my digital phone, which sounds like me and is able to do things that I can't do. So I would love to talk to each and every single one of you, but you know, like, I can't, I'm human, right? But I can right now. So send me a text at this number and watch me talk to all of you. 402-698-3599. That's 402-698-3599. So what I have here is this thing on autopilot and it will pitch you Yobi, it'll answer all of your questions about Yobi and it may seem like a dumber version of ChatGPT. It's not a dumber version of ChatGPT. It's just a really good SDR. It knows to not talk about things outside of business. And that's sort of, that's basically Yobi in a nutshell. All right, so I got a question for you. <clears throat> um, so with our conversational AI investments that we've made, we've invested in conversational AI in education. We've invested in four companies so far, education, conversational AI tools for content creators and streamers, content, conversational AI customer service stuff oriented around investment banks, and conversational AI solutions for high-end cars. So my question for you is, one of the things that we've seen in evaluating a lot of companies is that when you come to the market <coughs> with different AI-oriented tools, either you understand that you're gonna to gravitate toward one particular industry vertical, maybe two possibly, or you get kind of pulled that direction invisible hand style. <clears throat> what, what's been the main industry vertical or two that Yobi has seen traction in since you've, since you've launched? So it's been kind of a crazy experience. Uh, we were in dentistry before. If you have a couple thousand dentists, you're like a serious company. Right, um, so we had, we had 300 customers after like six months, and I was like, oh crap, <laughs> shouldn't have invested all my money in this. But that was a good call because very soon thereafter, like one month, suddenly we started ranking higher than Google Voice. Again, for the simple like usability of it. Uh, and then we got a, our first thousand customers all of a sudden that month. So we've had over 20,000 businesses sign up. We have uh, almost 30,000 users. They've mostly been small businesses, uh, lots of services companies, plumbing companies. Uh, we have lawyers who use it, and they, they use it in different ways. But what's, what's been really crazy is we started introducing the AI agent last summer. Uh, actually, no, before last summer. I'm kind of losing track of time here. Um, but we were using GPT-3 to basically converse with them. So a lot of these businesses, this was their first, you know, they were just the founder, right? Or just the person, one, one man shop. Our AI would be like their first partner, their first employee. And because you've been using our platform to send messages, we'd learn how you speak. We'd learn what you say, and we'd start automating things. We'd start taking some of the load off your shoulders, and the value becomes really apparent then, right? Uh, so you realize, hey, this AI is here to help uh, you know, we primarily focus on business, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been crazy to you know focus on more than one, but we see very very similar patterns. Uh, and something that I personally felt like I wish I could clone myself. I think many people in this room probably feel the same thing. It's like I wish I could have two of me. You know, I hired salespeople, I hired all these other folks, I try to train them, and then you know, their dog gets sick and, you know, they're not working and you are. So now that my AI agent is always on 24 seven, speaks multiple languages. So if you want to talk to my synthetic agent in a different language, you know, it's, it's a pretty good SDR. It keeps me pretty, pretty busy.
Excellent. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So Vivek, tell us all about either the primary use of AI in your organization to retain customers or something that you're discussing actively now and looking to implement soon. Sure, Brad. Uh, at Foot Locker, basically, if you think about any um, global retailer today, AI has been utilized in multiple different ways. Uh, it is part of our infosec to keep uh, to keep our uh, websites, e-commerce sites, and our infrastructure safe. Right from there, all the way to predicting demand, to predicting uh, inventory, to supply chain, and everywhere else in between. So right from a choice of merchandising, or from a buyer and a allocation plan, to doing a promo, or to do a pricing, or run a promo across uh, our um, 30 different countries across the globe, uh, AI is utilized everywhere, basically. In, con in context to our uh, customer retention aspect, there are uh, three different uh, scenarios that I will uh, kind of uh, bubble up where AI is uh, very much in use and is helpful directly connect to our customers. One is there is a, FLX is our loyalty platform and uh, there is a lot of AI usage there in terms of next best action based on the recommendations, what, uh, based on their past, perform uh, past buying habits, what uh, next uh, loyalty customer would like to use. So creating uh, custom promos and, and, and pushing it out through the FLX uh, platform, whether on their web page or whether through their app, that has been a big area of uh, utilization of AI and something where we are also furthering with the Gen AI uh, ideas. The second one is essentially uh, the shipment. So when you are buying uh, online through an e-commerce uh, or an app, uh, the big piece is like, okay, when will I get hit? Or which is the right way of, should I buy online, pick in store or what is in called Bopus? Or should I uh, buy and uh, ship to store, or which is called Boss? Or should I just buy and ship it directly to the home, right? Those options, and then associated uh, pricing and associated deals around those options. That's another big area that we uh, work on. And the third thing is uh, overall, essentially, uh, the, the demand. Like, sneakers, uh, for those who love sneakers, like, it's a, it's a big, uh, loyalty-based uh, uh, followers. So when Nike or Brooks or Adidas or any of our vendors are coming up with their next uh, se season of sneaker launches, uh, which is six months out or 12 months out, and we are planning for, ahead for it, what is the market trends that is happening? Like, so think about any luxury retailer, how they would uh, enable AI. Looking at the, the trends that is happening, like a, a great trend is maybe before pandemic, on this panel, you won't find anybody wearing sneakers, basically. But as uh, work from home has become more common and we are moving into this, uh, uh, this uh, area or a new uh, idea of business, but with uh, ease or business with uh, the ease of moving, movement and, and uh, athletic share. That's an area that is coming up like crazy. That's why you and I are both wearing sneakers on this panel. So that's, that's how these trends are changing. And it's hard to predict these trends, uh, which are six to 12 months out. So that's where, again, AI is a big, big uh, 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 use cases for what predicting future, basically, from demand perspective, and how much to buy, and where to ship, and where to store, and stuff like that. Are you suggesting I wouldn't have worn these seven years ago doing this on a conference stage? I got bad news for you. Well, I, I, would, I would say uh, if you were doing it, you, you are the trendsetter and trailblazer at that Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I, I love what you said, and 
um, just I, I like the retail space in general just uh, for the the rich data it collects and and figuring out ways to bring algorithmic pattern matching to the party and one of the stories that I'll occasionally tell when I'm speaking on this topic is about uh, two decades ago, maybe a little shy of that, Target was in the news because what they had done is they had figured out um, one of their analysts had studied a bunch of data and figured out, hey, when there's women coming in here and they're buying five or six of these items out of these nine or 10 items, we know within a 90 to 95% confidence interval that they're pregnant. And then we can start marketing to them. And as the story goes, uh, they implemented this initiative around this aha moment. And this, uh, this farmer out in Kansas or Nebraska or something, I forget where, it doesn't matter, um, started getting these pink catalogs saying, hey, here's your 15% off discount. Congratulations on your pregnancy. And he started to get more and more angry as he received these. So he took it in the store, tried to get off the list, didn't work. Um, and the, the punchline at the end of the story is that, indeed, his 16-year-old daughter was pregnant. And she didn't even know yet. She thought, but she didn't know for sure. And there's a, there's, a, there's a story in there, a lesson about how dangerous we can be with data um, and, and getting out in front of even what we perceive as human beings. I just want to ask you before we shift gears into the back half of this discussion, if there's been some sort of aha moment with you uh, and Foot Locker in terms of the data that you've been having exposure to and capturing. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, you reminded me of this story. This was like this was one of those uh, like hot of the press things uh, way back when you uh, what you shared. And uh, I, mean, so I happened to be in Minneapolis, and uh, actually at that time when this story got a lot of national press and attention. So yeah, so one of the things that we at Foot Locker have been uh, has enabled more so in the recent past with uh, a lot of focus on, uh, on the data and privacy from a regulator's perspective, whether the uh, California data or, or we have a big business in, uh, in uh, Europe, so GDPR and others. So there is, a, a, I guess, a sustainable practice of using the data in a responsible way. So when we are talking of responsible AI practices, that is a big, big area that uh, we actually came up with an internal uh, 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 memo, I would say, just two weeks back, because more and more people uh, from Foot Locker have been trying to go out and using ChatGPT and using, uh, and without understanding the, the ramifications it may have, we don't want to have a, have a press like that, basically, right? That bad press, and more so in that area there was, Social media was just picking up and all. Today, if you, if you have something like that, it's going to just go, go crazy, wild, pretty quickly. So, so to, to your point, yes, there are uh, aha moments where we find certain uh, patterns, but then uh, the question is, okay, this is a good business uh, 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 insight, but is it uh, the right thing for us to do from our stakeholder perspective? from uh, looking at our responsible AI framework and making sure that, okay, what may be a good business practice may not be a good or ethical business practice, if that makes sense. And, and those lines are getting so blurred nowadays, it's, it's always hard. You have to always keep up on, on, on that because it m might be a good, uh, something that A, your competitor may be doing, but they can do it just because they are smaller in size or their exposure is not that much. But we as a $10 billion uh, global retailer should not be doing. So, so that's a constant struggle and a constant evolution to answer you. And, and means that that's a big part of uh, my job at Foot Locker as well, to kind of uh, make sure that we are spearheading it and keeping it safe from that perspective. Brad, I'll, 
I'll just comment too, because this is a really important point, I think, for anyone that's starting to go down this path of investing or experimenting with, you know, intelligent solutions for their customers. Uh, it, it can't be stressed enough that it's really worth the time to do the storyboarding of what those customer experiences might look like. And Capital One certainly takes privacy very seriously and protecting people's data very seriously. And as an engineer, as a technologist, you know, you start to see these new capabilities and these new tools come out and you get very creative and imaginative about all these great, wonderful things you can do. But I think as a technologist, one of the many aha moments I've had is when you actually start storyboarding out those customer experiences, you can end up at a lot of dead ends like, oh, wait, it's not good that we would, you know, proactively try to do this in all these different scenarios. It might be in this one, but, you know, in the, the uh, story you gave about the daughter, um, there's, there's many avenues you could go down where you would run into some of those really poor experiences and you have to balance that against like what the, ex the actual expected outcome is, like what goal you're really trying to have for your customer, for your business, uh, and really have to like vet, is that going to be the right experience that you want your brand to be able to have with those customers? Because I think that actually narrows down the opportunity too. Like when you really think about the, the broad, expansive applications of some of these capabilities and what you could do, it really comes down to what you should do and what's going to be on brand for your customers and what's going to be really relevant and impactful for them where they're going to feel like, um, you know, this was an improvement from where, what you had or what you did previously. Well, all of that dovetails nicely, <clears throat> you know, what all th three of y'all said uh, with what I want to ask about sort of to close this. Um, and, <clears throat> but before I do that, I just want to share um, yesterday in promoting this panel, I wrote about in the newsletter that I publish about um, a story coming out of the publishing realm where <clears throat> this big publishing and in, in book publishing industry veteran influencer person decided to go look on Amazon for some reason to see what books showed up under her name. She's written several. And she was uh, unpleasantly surprised to find out that there was, um, as opposed to the 15 or so books that she's written, there was about 45 to 50 books under her name, uh, the majority of which were AI-created books ripping off her content using her name. Then she also discovered that Goodreads, this other website um, that's designed to make finding books easier, um, has, without asking her or with any permission from anyone, connected these AI-oriented books, AI-written books written by fraudulent individuals to her profile on Goodreads, and she has no recourse on Amazon and no recourse on Goodreads to get any of this stuff off. And she spent the last probably 72 hours tweeting into the void, getting somebody to listen, uh, which finally someone has started to do that. So you don't have to go back very far in time to find negative customer experiences with different businesses <clears throat> with AI. And I, I use that to, to frame the question I want to end the panel with for all three of you, and I'm going to go in the same order. <clears throat> what is the biggest obstacle, either at a macro level, Charleston, with external forces in the economy or regu regulatory or elsewhere or internal to Capital One, what's the single biggest obstacle in your mind to greater adoption of AI? Well, well, that, there's many dimensions to that. Um, I, I don't think personally for Capital One we're foreseeing, you know, obstacles in our path. I think we're we're evaluating what's best for our customers and how we want to proceed more like what I was talking about previously. And, you know, again, you bring up a good cautionary tale that, you know, to just uh, rush into trying to provide customers with what you believe to be an improved experience is not always going to end up that way. And you also need to baseline that on, you know, the, the returns of those investments too, because you can end up down a path where you know, you've made a marginal improvement for, you know, a big investment. And, and that's not, you know, good for your business either. Um, I, I think like 
the obstacles that are generally out there, even at a macro level right now, is we probably haven't, and this is not necessarily Capital One specific, we haven't probably thought about um, enough of, as an industry, enough about the ethical privacy, even regulatory constraints that we want to be able to put on some of these practices. You know, I know that's a big story in the news about OpenAI talking about, um, you know, inviting regulation. I think that's come up in a couple other talks I've been in this week too. Uh, and I think that's, that's something that would definitely be welcome. You know, certainly Capital One operates in a very regulated environment and I think that helps everyone make sure that they are investing in the right areas that are really enduring um, as opposed to going down paths that potentially could be you know, in the gray. And I, I think that's something that will really help accelerate people's ability to capitalize off of these new new innovations because there will be a clear sign that this is something that is uh, demonstrably going to improve customer experiences. So there, there's definitely a, um, there's definitely a very like accessible path to move forward and how we go about, how we go about that. But I think, Again, it's all gonna start from the customer and what's really gonna make the customer's lives better. Perfect, <clears throat> Ahmed, same question for you. What's the single biggest obstacle you see, big or small, macro or micro, in, for greater AI adoption and greater adoption of Yobi? So I'll do another little show and tell here, uh, especially since I have this guy here right next to me. So speaking of security, I called Chase the other day. There was some issue and said, uh, would you like us to unlock your account with voice? This is the AI version of me. Hey there, my name is Ahmed Reza and I am the founder of Yobi, an AI communication app for businesses. Co-founder. I never said those things, right? In any language, including. So yeah, please do disable the voice authentication. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not want to be either one of these gentlemen right now. Uh, I, and I think the third thing is, uh, so yeah, there's amazing things that you can do, right? This is my synthetic agent. I control the voices and now I can speak to more people more naturally, right? Things I could only dream of, but you can easily like do really horrible things with it, right? Like take my voice and say things, you know, that I didn't say. So I don't know, oops, sorry. Uh, I don't know if there's something that's going to stop the adoption of AI. It's here, it's absolutely here. So I'm looking around, uh, by the way, hi Ishmael, wherever you are. Yes, I see you texting me. Um, <laughs> so it's here. Like some folks, uh, you know, got up, probably are trying to get to the next panel, but guess what? They're here, it's engaged. Are these gentlemen gonna walk away from here and not do that customer engagement? Absolutely not, right? Like business is about competition. Once this thing starts making money 10 times, 100 times more than a normal person, you're gonna adopt this, right? Uh, and the bigger challenge for us technologists, those who have lived through like the, you know, Anybody here remember like phones that had the little dials on it? Yeah. That's those. right. Like a lot of people remember. Think about how fast we've gone from that to like me speaking Chinese. Like I don't, right? <laughs> think about how fast that happened. It's about to accelerate even faster. So this is the first time like as a tech geek, I can't just be hyped about AI and be like, oh, this is so cool. I should just release this, too, right? I have to think about how are they going to use Yobi. We have a very, very serious anti-spam program. And I remember some uh, early VC conversations that were like, oh, you know, that's not impressive that you're spending a lot of, you know, your money on anti-spam. And of course, we did not talk to that VC again. Um, because you, you just don't understand how important anti-spam is because this can enable spammers, this can, this can enable a lot of unethical behavior. So we take it very seriously to make sure that that doesn't happen. And yes, there's gonna be regula regulations, but we as technologists understand that this is moving so fast, we bear responsibility to make sure that that decision-making framework in our head, that ethical part of our brains are active and working and that we're speaking up. Perfect, and Vivek, I'm gonna give you the last word. The, the biggest uh, obstacle in front of AI adoption. So I, I wouldn't consider it to be an obstacle to uh, adoption. So a few uh, tidbits to, to just uh, consider. 
It took 17 years for iPod to reach 100 million customers. It took about seven years for uh, Netflix to reach their 100 million um, customer. ChatGPT, it took two months to reach 100 million customers. So adoption is there. And that's what it makes making it challenging, actually. That, that fast rate of adoption has never happened in history uh, around a, a, a technology that is just so much powerful and capable. I think where the challenge would be, like at a personal level, there is adoption happening. It's my six-year-old uh, daughter. She's writing our school essays looking at ChatGPT, right? So, so it's that adoption is happening across the board, uh, left and right, through all through the center. It's the business adoption. Like the, the corporate by design has not been ever able to be that nimble and that fast. And we have... Uh, like uh, my technology team using their personal devices to code using chat GPT. And I'm like, okay, how do I make sure that Foot Locker is being uh, able to move as quickly, as fast as it can, so that we are uh, on the uh, forefront of this. So I think adoption is not the problem. The responsible adoption of it in a corporate environment is the biggest challenge that I see. Well said. So let's give these three guys a round of applause.